Hello, everyone, and welcome to Gadgets, your weekly video podcast from Gizmodo, where we will explain the latest in technology. I am your host, Michelle Earhart, Deputy Consumer Tech Editor, and we're recording a little late this week due to sickness. So instead of Florence Ion, your usual co-host, today I have honorary do-jet Philip Tracy joining me. Philip Tracy is an excellent writer for our site. How are you doing, Phil? Doing all right. Thanks for having me back. Awesome. Thanks for uh, joining us. Phil has done excellent hands-on and review work with the Apple M2 chip, uh, where we're, which we're excited to talk about this week. Um, and he also covered some of the new Sony peripherals, which I reviewed the headset for. So we're also going to talk about that this week. Um, and then we're going to end the podcast with a quick little Let's Fan segment about uh, Taika Waititi's latest sitcoms. Uh, we were just slacking the other day about it, and I don't know how this man puts out so much work, but let's see. There's What We Do in the Shadows, there's Wellington Paranormal, and now on HBO Max, there's Our Flag Means Death. Um, plus all his movie work. They have the new Thor movie coming out soon. So there's definitely a lot to talk about. So without further ado, let's take a quick break and just get right into it. Okay, so starting us off this week, we're going to talk about Apple's new M2 chip. It's follow-up to the uh, M1 chip, the M1 Pro, Ultra, Max, Super Saiyan, Blue of all, all of the them. chips. Yeah, there's so many M1 variations, but now Apple's just decided to start clean-ish, I guess, with the M2. Um, Phil, I know that you've had hands-on time with the MacBook Air, uh, which has this chip uh, at WWDC. And then recently you got an opportunity to review the uh, MacBook Pro 13, which you had some mixed feelings about, but I don't think about the chip. Yeah, no, it wasn't the, the chip isn't what holds it back. In fact, the chip is probably the the one element of that laptop that keeps it competitive because uh, Apple really hasn't done much to the, the Pro 13 for the last however many years. And it's just looking a little old. I mean, the bezels are kind of thick. It doesn't have an IR camera like you find on all, just about all window, premium Windows laptops. Um, it isn't as elegant as some of the other newer laptops. And then you have the new Air, which gets the redesign while the MacBook Pro 13 still has that same old design and the smaller screen, right. uh, which is, I think, a big draw for a lot of people. 13.6 inch on the, on the new Air, and then the Pro still has the 13.3 inch display. And they have the same M2 processor. So they're like basically about the same in power with the difference being that the macbook pro has fans right that's it it has fans and apple claims that this allows for sustained performance and i believe it you probably don't want to use the air as powerful as it is for hours on end for an entire day doing something like video editing or photo editing it can do it but because it doesn't have a fan eventually it will heat up and then the processor will throttle, your performance will lower. With the with the Pro, it has those fans to keep the, the device cool throughout a long session so you can maintain that performance over time. How many people will actually need those fans? The problem with the Pro is that if you're spending all day video editing or photo editing, I assume for a lot of people that means it's their, it's their job and a lot of people, you know, if it's that important to them, they'll just go up to the the Pro 14. So, uh, you know, those folks will will just spend extra money for the Pro 14, which gets you all sorts of upgrades, including faster performance. So the Pro 13 is in this weird middle ground where, like, it's not really for the entry level consumer because that's what the Air is for. It's less expensive, and now it's even better. I mean, it has upgraded elements to it, a 1080p webcam, it has the larger display, it has the newer design. And the Pro isn't exactly for prosumer or professional users. Right. Because that's it's what weird the Pro to me that for. like, um, you almost have to have a pros and, and cons list for the Pro. I'm used to the Pro on a specs level, at least outweighing the air right. in every way. Yeah. But it's got that 720p webcam and it's got the touch bar, which I touch know bar, yeah. <laughs> there aren't always fans of. 
Um, and then True. it's got the um, the smaller display. Now, granted, yeah. with that smaller display, you don't have a notch. And I know we had, um, no, we've discussed the notch back and forth, the MacBook Air, uh, in order to get its larger display without making the laptop actually bigger. Um, right cuts a notch into the screen for the webcam to come down. I would almost be interested in like a webcam less laptop so that you don't have <laughs> to have a notch, but you can still have a big display. Although I'm recording yeah. off a MacBook Air M1 right now uh, with its internal uh, webcam. But Phil, I don't know. Do you think the, um, the, pro, the pro's lack of a notch makes up for the smaller display? Because I know I've I seen comments being like, it's still bigger, so you shouldn't care about the notch. But part yeah. of me feels like this is a hill I don't want to die on. But It's a hill I would rather not die on, but it's one where Apple is almost making you die on it. I mean, there's like the argument against does just doesn't quite hold up because you get the, like like people mentioned, you get the larger display, you get the thinner bezels, which I think looks it almost sort of outweighs the notch because it looks more attractive than those thick bars around which That's by the true. way like no premium windows laptops have bezels as thick as the macbook pro 13 not at that price so apple just they're not really doing the bare minimum there and then but the notch does bother me because i don't understand why it's there if they had used like uh, really advanced their face id is very advanced facial recognition technology mm -hmm. if they had included that i would have it would have been okay. I understand you used it for the iPhone. You needed the extra space for all of the sensors and whatnot. But the notch is there and Face ID isn't. And again, that's another feature missing from Macs that you get on Windows laptops. A lot of them yeah, have Windows an Hello. IR. Yeah, Windows Hello, right? For facial recognition. It's super convenient. Um, I don't really understand why the notch is there. It doesn't really need to be. Aesthetically, I don't love it. But I also don't think it should be... I don't think it's that as big of a problem as some people claim it is. It okay. is ugly. I don't think it really hurts the actual experience of using the laptop that much. Okay, good. I'm glad to at least like hear acknowledgement that the notch is a weird choice because sometimes I talk to it and I feel like I'm the only one in the room who can see the giant pink elephant. Um, no, but... it, it is. It's it's awkward. It's strange. I, I think Apple's explanation is that they needed that extra space for a 1080p camera, but really no other vendor has a notch and plenty of just about the entire roster of everyone's 2022 roster has a 1080p camera. Some are better than others. Let's take um, a quick break about that because this yeah. this um, MacBook Pro has a 720p camera. We've mm -hmm. already been talking about whether 1080p laptop webcams are even worth it. So this yep. was one step below that. Yes. So yeah, let's talk about that. So 1080p on paper sounds great. You get higher resolution, which means ideally you get a sharper image. The problem is that if you put a 1080p camera on a tiny bezel, you don't have the space for a large image sensor. And if the image sensor is too small, it doesn't capture enough light. So essentially what you're doing is you're adding more pixels, you're adding higher resolution, but if you don't have the light, all that does is reveal a darker image. It reveals more noise. So I found that a lot of 1080p webcams actually have more digital noise, or it looks like they have they capture more digital noise than a standard 720p because they have higher resolution, but they don't balance that with a bigger image sensor with uh, the ability to capture more light. So essentially you're like, you're enhancing a bad image with a poor 1080p webcam. Right. I'm What I'm really interested in is the um, tech that they're going to introduce where you can use your iPhone as a webcam. There's third party right. apps for that now. Um, particularly, I think EpoCam, which is now owned by Corsair, uh, is probably oh. the go-to one for that. Um, I believe mm -hmm. it's owned by Corsair. I'll, I'll look it up afterwards and we'll put a correction on screen if it's not. <laughs> um, but I believe it was during the start of the pandemic, a weird third-party sort of indie company thing. And then Corsair was like, video conferencing is huge now. Let's buy this app that lets you use your smartphone as a webcam. 
but obviously a, a native Apple integration is going to work a lot smoother. Um, and obviously, I don't know if it's better to have a notch or to have a phone clamped <laughs> to your screen, nice and thick and heavy to your thin screen that's going to fall right. over. Right. But iPhones that... do. Smartphones have much better image quality than oh, yeah. webcams for like 99% of them. And the reason is because they have processors on board that lets them do computational photography where they can run all sorts of real time, tiny mini edits in the background that are automatic to make you look better. Now there's philosophy there, like are you capturing reality there? Um, but, you know, for a video call, I probably, or especially a job interview, I probably want to look my best, maybe even better than my best, right? Um, <laughs> right. And so we've seen expensive, like $300 webcams, like the Opal C1 come out that try to mimic what a smartphone can do. Um, but, you know, they're, they're dedicated devices that are very expensive just to be a webcam. So to be able to take the phone that you already have and mirror that sort of quality is very cool to me and maybe solves this notch issue if you're willing to deal with strapping a giant phone to your display. <laughs> Right. I, yeah, I agree. I, I think it's it's an interesting idea. I'm sure it's one a lot of companies have thought of. The implementation will be fascinating. I trust that Apple can pull it off. But as you mentioned, you're putting a pretty chunky and, and iPhones aren't the the lightest devices out there. Uh, mm -hmm. They have some heft to them and you're clamping it to the back of a razor thin laptop lid. Um, I don't I don't know structurally if it'll hold up, but if it does, the benefit is not only are you getting not only is the is any any smartphone's front facing camera better than a webcam but you can actually use the rear facing cameras which are actually now have huge sensors can capture tons of light really high resolution high high megapixels that i mean i don't need to tell anybody how how much better that image can be um yeah it, it's just a matter of like w will the hardware be compatible uh, you'll need MagSafe to clamp to the back. I actually think it would be super convenient. If you have a magnet, you just clamp it to the back, you're good to go. If it's as simple as that, and Apple is saying you can do it wirelessly, by the way, this feature is called Continuity. It's coming on macOS Ventura, macOS 13 uh, later this year. If it is as simple as just clamping it to the back, I don't see why you wouldn't use it so long as uh, that lid stays in place. And of course, not, it, not only should it not close, but it needs to stay absolutely perfectly um, in play. Like you can't move an inch or else, you know, your, your image will be wobbling and you'll be going all over the place that the, the video will be, uh, could be pretty rough. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I think it's a good idea if it, if they found a way to make it work and I'm fascinated to see how they did that. If in fact they did come up with a way to, to make it all work together. <laughs> but but then that gets back to the whole let's just get rid of the webcam altogether and maybe that's next i mean if continuity works and enough people adopt it then i don't see why you would need your your uh i think the internal webcam. the thing to be holding it back is these laptops are supposed to be simple and convenient and easy to use and for a lot of college students especially they're the only like computing device that they have so yeah. You know, especially in the era of uh, virtual classes and, and virtual work or remote work, um, webcams are extremely vital. Um, maybe as people start to go back to the office, companies will be, be uh, willing to experiment more with excluding them from devices. But I think consumers expect to be able to have a webcam right now. Yeah, um, if only as a backup. is yeah. Right. Uh, but you know, you already, most people already have a phone. Um, and if they make it front and clear on the, the laptop, you know, like this does not have a webcam provide your own. Uh, I think that would be a compelling option because usually laptop webcams, laptop microphones, not great. Um, yeah. definitely not the only option I think, but an alternative option, I would take it. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Before we end this segment, though, I did say we were going to talk about the M2, and yes. we haven't talked about it a lot, uh, so we'll just go a little long in this segment. It's fine. Phil, you've actually gotten to take the M2 chip home now and play with it a bit. What are your thoughts? Um, it's not as... It, it, 
it's not as much of a revelation as the M1 is or as the M M1 Pro Ultra or Max were when they were released. It's a it's almost like a familiar refresh. If you've been following AMD and Intel's uh, cadence for their chip refreshes, it feels like a next generation chip. It doesn't feel like the next big thing. And it didn't really need to be because the M1 was so much better than anything out there. What I do think this means is that Apple isn't going to just absolutely dominate and crush the competition year after year. It does give Intel and AMD a chance to catch up some because yes, you get performance upgrades, but they aren't the, the leap forward. And I can provide some numbers here. Um, you know, we were seeing increases of around 15% better performance than before. Um, that's more or less what you'd expect uh, year over year for, for a chip upgrade. And that makes sense because Apple needs to keep the M2 below the M1 Pro, the M1 Max, and the M1 Ultra. You don't want the MacBook Air to be more powerful than that however many thousands of dollars the Mac Studio costs or the starting at $2,000 MacBook Pro 14 and even more expensive 16-inch version. So yeah, so we saw uh, Apple saying 18% faster CPU performance. We saw 15, that's kind of within the margin of error. Uh, much faster GPU speeds, but testing all of these games was just a nightmare on the Mac. Steam was just, it, it would crash all the time. The games weren't optimized for Mac. I had to test some at lower resolutions because it didn't even pick up the full resolution of the laptop. So like the GPU improvements are great for video editing, photo editing, other GPU intensive tasks. They're not really good for gaming because it's just this, the software isn't there to begin with. The platform isn't there. Um, no, that's so, a yeah. shame. I, I, you know, I always <laughs> like say, I know PC gamers or, you know, computer gamers don't look to Mac for gaming, but I remember, you know, a decade ago we had a big push like, oh, Team Fortress is on Mac now, Half-Life. <laughs> is on Mac now, Steam is on Mac now. Even right. that was big when it happened. Uh, right. So it's it's a bit of a shame to see, you know, a few years after that, Mac still, especially on its own homegrown chips, uh, lagging behind on gaming, especially because uh, one of the things I was most impressed about at WWDC is when they brought Capcom out, out of nowhere. It's right. like, here's yeah. Resident Evil Village running mm -hmm. natively on a, I believe, M2 chip. Yeah. Well, I trust it can do that. It's just the problem is that developers don't optimize their games for Mac. And if they did, the power is there. It's just sitting there waiting. But it's a lot of work to do that. And then the question is, if I bring this to Mac, are there enough gamers there? Because gamers right. know to buy a PC. They've known that for years. So is, is there really enough of a payoff to bring my game to Mac? I, I do trust that if games get optimized, if they end up on Mac, they're 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 natively run on the M2 chip, that they'll run great because it is an extremely powerful chip. And to be clear, mm -hmm. although the M2 is somewhat of a minor refresh, it is an unbelievably impressive chip because not only do you get performance that equals or tops equivalent Intel and AMD chips, but the MacBook Air that's coming out doesn't even need a fan, and the MacBook Pro stayed extremely quiet and cool during my testing. Plus, we haven't even talked about efficiency. It's just as efficient as the previous chip. So you're looking at something like 15 to 18 hours of use from the MacBook Pro. I mean, that's a class leading. Uh, there are only one or two Windows laptops I can think of that get close to that number. The MacBook Air doesn't quite last as long. That's probably more like 12 to 15 hours, but that's still incredible battery life. So this chip is, it's powerful, it's efficient, stays cool under heavy workloads. Apple is still leading in that way when it not even, and I don't mean just the entry level chip, the M1, but all the way up to the M1 Ultra, what, what Apple has achieved in the last couple of years is pretty staggering. Um, like I said, uh, the, the, the race, the battle isn't over yet until an AMD can still make gains. Um, but the efficiency, it's that the performance to power ratio is just, is unrivaled right now. What Intel likes to do is say, yeah, you can play, but you can't play certain games on a Mac, but you can on this gaming laptop. Well, sure you can, but it has a discrete GPU that is just, it needs so much power. It's so inefficient. And that results in like a few hours of battery life. 
the Mac gets you that power, maybe not quite as much if you have a discrete GPU, but then it also lasts a full day on a charge. So still Apple is ahead. It'll be interesting to see Intel and AMD are both due up for next for a new generation of chips. We'll see how well those fare. Um, but yeah, overall, very impressed with the M2. Thank you, Phil, for that analysis. What I'm hearing is um, if I have an M1 MacBook Air, which I'm actually recording on right now, this is provided by work, so it's not my choice to upgrade. I might want to upgrade because it's got a nice sleek body. It's new. It's not like a ton more powerful, so I might not need to. What I'm curious about is if you have an M1 MacBook Pro, why would you upgrade? <laughs> because uh, the yeah the 13 inch you you shouldn't um yeah. if, you can upgrade to the air <laughs> mm -hmm. to the m2 air uh yeah if you bought the m1 air you might be feeling oh man i, I got this thing and now they're redesigning it and now it's got all these fancy features but really it's not that different like they added a notch which not everyone will love they did make it a little sleeker supposedly but it, it no longer has that wedge-shaped design, which I actually really liked. It's now like flatter. Mm -hmm. um, and because of that, I actually don't think it feels any, any thinner or any more portable than the previous version. You do get two nice new colors. They're not super exciting to me. One of them's like a dark blue, but it's so dark it looks black. Uh, another one's like a soft gold color, which we've, we've seen before. Um, yeah, the upgraded performance is nice. Also. Yeah, Sorry, I had to represent these Flow because I know Flow has style, but I... they're they're nice. They're nice colors. They just don't. I mean, compared to some stuff that like Asus is doing, uh, they they're not as rich. They're not as vibrant. For some people, that's great. They're more conservative colors. I prefer a, a bit of pop. Um, I agree. But yeah, the big the big. I think the display is really the big thing. It's bigger, thirteen point six inches, and it's brighter, twenty five percent. The speakers were upgraded. They're quad speakers now, and ten eighty p webcam. So those awesome. are nice little things. I don't know if they necessarily, I don't think you should feel too bad if you have an M1 Air. So talking about displays, I've actually got a display behind the laptop I'm recording on from Sony. Sony has released a bunch of new PC gaming peripherals that kind of look like PlayStation gear, but trust, trust them, you guys, they're <laughs> not for PlayStation. So we're going to take a quick break and come back and then talk about it. And we're back, and this time we're going to be discussing Sony's new in-zone PC gaming peripherals. They revealed these last week. There are uh, two monitors, one of which I have set up behind my laptop, and we'll uh, swivel the screen around a little bit so you can see it. Then there are three headsets, two of which I have off to the side here. What sets these apart is that these, I spoke to the, the people who made this, these are not made by the PlayStation team. They have some collaboration with PlayStation. You can especially tell that in the design. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, but these are marketed primarily at PC gamers. And the headsets, I think, are probably the most impressive thing because they are less like the Pulse 3D sort of PS5 headset that exists already and more like the forgive me, I think WH-1000 XM5, those impressive noise canceling uh, sort of AirPods Max competitors that Sony has. Uh, so Phil, I know you covered the uh, news for this. Uh, I wrote a review about InZone, but uh, that name right off the bat, what do we think about this as Sony's big PC gaming hardware? Um, uh... I don't love the name InZone. I think it sounds like uh, like a Radio Shack brand or something like that. Right. Um, yeah, that doesn't it doesn't click with me. And also, you have PlayStation. It's like in the gaming community, that is one of the most coveted names, the most coveted brands. Why not just use that? I understand right? that they don't want to you know, shoehorn this into being a PlayStation product that only works for their consoles, but. If the marketing is good enough, if it's communication with customers is good enough, you can you can explain that these are PlayStation products, but they work with your PC. Uh, I think PC people would get excited about that. Because I think I so think, too. Yeah. Like I think if you so these come with in zone hub software. Uh, that's not available when you plug them into the PS5. They do work with the PS5. The headsets come with Tempest 3D audio, and then the 
monitor, both on PC and in PS5, has an auto genre picture mode um, where, like, if you're watching a, a movie, it'll swap so that, like, you know, the colors are nice and whatever. And then if you're watching a game, it'll automatically swap to game mode, which I think is nice. I have an LG C1 TV that I really enjoy. Really excellent quality. Yeah. Um, but I, I plug my PS5 into it and I game and stream on that. And mm -hmm. uh, it has like a game optimizer sound mode that sounds terrible. Um, <laughs> but it always wants to use that even when I'm uh, streaming a movie or something because it thinks, oh, you have a game console plugged into me. Uh, so it's nice to, for Sony to take that into consideration. But yeah, mm -hmm. I got about a week with these. Uh, I looked at the M9 uh, monitor. Uh, I haven't been able to write anything up about that yet. But what I did write was a review of these. These are the H Zone N9 uh, heads H9 headset, um, and you can see it's got kind of the PlayStation white on it. It's got these notched uh, ear cups for. Uh, comfort which i think is nice i had a steel series recently come up to me and be like oh we have like a smooth uh adjustment headset i'm like but then i won't know if everything's peripheral um symmetrical they have uh sort of uh, the white is might make you nervous about scratches and stuff and it does get a little bit dirty if you just stuff it into a bag but it's matte plastic so you can just wipe it off um it has this uh, boom arm that works on a swivel. It's not detachable like some gaming headsets have been doing. But what that means is you get the uh, swivel up to mute function, which I think is always really nice because then you know whether or not your headset is recording. Obviously, is nice. yeah. it, um, it bends as well. But the key feature here is the active noise canceling. So this has a 2.4 gigahertz dongle that it comes with and Bluetooth, and you can connect simultaneously to those. But that means this is the only Sony headset right now, I believe, that has both Sony's active noise canceling tech and 2.4 gigahertz wireless. I do, this is maybe a hot take on me, I do think active noise canceling is a little bit of a luxury feature on a gaming headset, because typically you're going to be inside in a, a controlled space. But I know not everyone is like, an adult with a dedicated office like I do, like I have. So I can understand the appeal to this. And the active noise canceling on this is excellent. It is the best active noise canceling I've listened to, period. I have AirPods Pros in right now. Obviously, those are earbuds, so it's not perfectly comparable. Um, but this beats those by a mile. So by comparison... Despite this looking very silly, I took this on the subway <laughs> and uh, I did my whole commute to work with it. Um, and typically when I listen to a podcast with my AirPods Pro and noise canceling, I have to listen to it at about 50% volume um, in order to hear it over the train. Um, I was able to listen to a podcast at one third volume. Same experience with this headset, which is nice. easier on my ears. Um, and yeah, it just works. And if it does, for whatever reason, get a little louder, then you have plenty of room to pump it up. The on-headset controls are also very nice. You have dedicated physical, uh, physical button. Very nice. You don't have to, you know, do, use a touch button. You don't have to figure out a weird combo with the power button. You can just boop noise canceling on, boop noise canceling off. Uh, same with a uh, Bluetooth. And then this is a weird little button where you can uh, uh, send certain... Yeah. You can make your game a little quieter to hear the person talking to mm. you, uh, or you can make your chat a little quieter to hear the game. Uh, nice. I tried that out with Phil over a call, and I thought it worked pretty well. Overall, I'm pretty happy with this headset, except there's two complaints that I have. Complaint number one, and I'm not recording on it right now just because of the way our recording setup works, but I'll record a voice sample afterwards and see if we can cut it into the podcast. This microphone is garbage it's, it's not good awful. it's potato tier uh so i listened back to it myself afterwards but the first time i heard this microphone's quality i was on a, a call with phil using it and phil you did not like it as i, I was <laughs> yeah no i didn't and i was trying to be like a little nice about it i didn't want to be too forward because i you know it was like a 
it was a Slack call. I don't know if they're compressing the audio or anything, but I did. And we didn't even, the call wasn't even for me to give my impression of the mic. But right before you, you hung up, I said, wait, are you, are you using the mic on those? And mm-hmm. you're like, you, you made sure and you said, yeah. And so, um, yeah, I, I had to just say like, those don't sound that great. I'm interested to hear what you think when you do more testing. And then you came back like 30 minutes later and you're like, these are trash. Yeah, no. They're, so it's super quiet. It's super tinny. It's very yep. echoey. Uh, again, I'll, I'll send out a, a sample, which will talk to it better than, uh, than I can describe it. And as you can hear, it sounds kind of like a mix between a walkie-talkie and an early cell phone. Not the best audio quality in the world, but I guess it will contribute to immersion in like military shooter games. But I would say it's probably worse than like the microphone built into your, if you have a Logitech C920 webcam, which is like the gold standard for budget webcams still, yep. um, it's probably what worse I'm shooting than on, microphone. by the way. Oh, nice. Uh, I'm shooting on the MacBook Air M1's uh, webcam. Um, If you have that webcam, though, it's got a terrible built-in microphone that is still better than like 80% of webcam microphones. And I would say that this sounds worse than that, which for a gaming headset, I think is a pretty big deal because, okay, you get the ANC with the 2.4 gigahertz. If you desperately need that lagless uh, quality, uh, and ANC, I understand. But if you just want like a good sounding gaming headset that you can talk to people with, this does not serve that function. So the only other reason to get it is because of audiophile stuff. And at that point, you might as well just get like Sony's dedicated gear for that. So this is a really strong quality headset, but I don't know if it's a particularly great gaming headset. And I'd love to see a, a version two improve on that. Uh, yeah, it's just, it, it's so, it's such a killer. I mean, they were so close. And then the mm-hmm. mic quality, and this is a company that has decades of experience making hi-fi audio. And they've improved the mics on the 1000 uh, and the Mach 5s, the Mach 4s even. Um, and then they make this mic that is, for a headset where the mic matters more than just about any other thing they're making, and they use a really cheap component. But also, I, I didn't um, realize that you couldn't detach the mic, which for me is another killer because these, it sounds like I read your review and it, the sound seems great. You get the ANC essentially from the uh, the 1000 mm-hmm. uh, X series. So these could be the the one headset to rule them all. And you noted that they, they look a little funny, but you take, if that mic was removable, I don't think they'd look that bad either. I don't think so either. They look really nice, actually. Like, aside from the mic, they're sleek. They've got this white thing. They're extremely comfortable. Uh, I'm wearing my glasses right now. The headset I normally game on at home tends to, like, push my glasses into my face after a couple Mm -hmm. of hours. It really hurts. Uh, But these are, like, smooth and light. And I know this sounds like a commercial, but I, like, am close to forgetting that I'm wearing it quite often when I do wear it. Um... And what else is it? These are closed ear, so you get that nice noise isolation. But the transparency mode, because the noise canceling is so good, is also very good. Uh, mm-hmm. So if you do you know, sit in a room where you need to talk to someone occasionally while you game or whatever, uh, this is good for that without compromising with an open ear headset, which is what I usually use at home. The problem yep. is there's another killer well, feature. I have <laughs> There's another killer, well, not killer as in good, but another feature that kills this headset a little bit aside from the mic, and that's the software, which I can show you on screen a little bit when I talk about the monitor in a second here, but it's just not very robust software. Uh, It comes with a full equalizer, which is nice, but it's got three presets on it. It's got flat, which doesn't mess with the equalizer at all, bass boost, which, you know, boosts the bass, and music slash video but no gaming presets, which is not something I've seen on like Razer or Logitech or, you know, Steel Series or proper gaming. They go by genre software. even, right? Right, yeah. So there usually there's a shooter preset, an right. RPG yeah. preset. Uh, Steel Series Sonar has a footsteps presets. Like if you're playing an FPS and you want to hear people, 
Uh, now, I know I'm going on and on about this headset. I should mention that there's a kind of cool spatial sound personalization feature on this where you connect it to an app and take photos of your ears. And then it tries to like make the spatial sound work in comparison or work uh, specifically tailored to your ear shape. I don't know. Using it at home, I didn't feel much of a difference between that and just like pure software, one size fits all solutions. But using it at a manicured Sony presentation, yeah, it sounded really good. I was able to hear Counter-Strike uh, bots through walls and stuff. Um, I just wasn't able to replicate that at home. And maybe that that's my fault, but, you know, it does require a lot of user effort to connect the software that comes to this headset with the phone app, take the photos, and then send it back to the point where I think a lot of people aren't going to use it, especially because the result is just kind of the same as any other spatial thing. And you can't, like, fucks with it at all. It's you take the pictures and then it gives you your personal profile and you can't like change like how far <laughs> or distant, um, how far or close things sound, uh, which is something you can do on Sonar. I know I'm talking about Sonar a lot, but I really like it. Um, and that's not the case here. So it can make it sound like, you know, conversations in cutscenes are happening really far away from you and the like. Mm. Um, but yeah, this is really good for listening on not especially great on the gaming features, which is a shame because Sony already has headsets that are really great for listening on. And the thing that's supposed to set this apart is the gaming. Okay. Features. Right. It looks great though. Um, and if you do want that look, this costs $300, which is why I'm being kind of hard on it. Uh, if you do want that yeah. look and similar headset quality without the ANC, which is a tough sell because ANC is half the point of this thing, there's also the H3 headset, which is wired. It's got this 3.5 millimeter cable that then comes with the USB dongle that you can plug into the uh, computer to be able to use the app with its full functionality. Um, I listened to this uh, swapping back and forth between the H9 during the same game session. I couldn't hear like a strict difference in audio quality. This still can do the spatial sound thing. It's just it lacks wireless and it lacks um, what the is noise it? noise cancellation. The noise canceling. Plus, it's still got the terrible mic. So it's just kind of like <laughs> a gaming headset. If you want something in the end zone brand and you don't want to spend a ton of money, which I understand because it that one's ninety nine sets it apart a ton. Aside mm -hmm. from that noise canceling, which doesn't set it apart from the rest of Sony's quality, yeah, these can, you can get for ninety nine dollars. Uh, but I've been rambling around about these headsets a lot. So we're still going to talk about the Sony stuff, but I'm going to take a quick break and adjust my computer so that we can talk about the M9 monitor. Um, and I need to adjust my webcam for that. We'll be right back. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm recording from a bit of a weird position, and that's because I have this big uh 27 inch i think monitor yep. this is the in zone m9 monitor which is the 4k at 144 hertz option of the two sony pc gaming monitors that they announced there's also the in zone m3 which is phil remind me is it 1440p or 1080p it's 1080 so 27 inch 1080p at 240 hertz awesome uh, these are both IPS displays, but they do have a uh, full array local dimming. So I got to use this a little bit. I haven't written a full review yet, and I kind of like it. It's decent. Uh, <laughs> I played Elden Ring and, and Counter-Strike and Overwatch on it. And what you get kind of with this is it's, a, it's an IPS. It's got G-Sync. It's not as impressive as like... QLED or mini LED or OLED, but that full array local dimming gives you more contrast and blacks than just a straight up IPS display. So I use an MSI optics at home. Um, and this is definitely a deeper picture than that. I have the software pulled up right now uh, on it. I'm not going to bother to pull up a game on it uh, because that's not going to come across over a webcam uh, anyway. Um, but you also get with this this interesting sort of PlayStation style look, which again makes me think that they should have just branded this as PlayStation gear. <laughs> but probably my favorite thing about this monitor is that you can just slide it 
up and down this little oh, arm nice. that looks like a PS5 that's on the front of it. And it doesn't take much pressure, pressure at all. So I'm just going to use two fingers here, slide up, two fingers here, slide down. I would like it if it could sit a little higher. So this is as high as it can sit right now. Um, I guess you have my Blue Yeti in my head for scale. Um, you know, some people have their, their desks up a little higher, so that would be helpful for that. And then on the back of this monitor, uh, I'll show a photo on screen rather than turning this thing around. But there's a, a decent little cable management system uh, where you can loop your cables through the front of this thing and then bring them around back and then keep them all in one spot. There's also built-in speakers um, I think the big problem for this monitor is, uh, this M9 that I'm working on is, I believe, $899. You yeah. have the, uh, the news article open right now, Phil, so you should, you would know better than me. Um, but that's, a, that's extremely expensive for an IPS display, even with that full array local dimming, which if you're not aware, it cuts the pixels into like 99 discrete zones, which can then... Uh, dim or, or brighten based on the uh, content being displayed on them, which creates a similar effect to OLED, where uh, the pixels are self-illuminating and can turn on and off on an individual basis to give you really deep blacks and contrast. Uh, but this still does not look as good at that, as that. It's only 99 zones. And for $899, I think you can get better than IPS, right? I think so. Just uh first for a comparison the alienware 34 inch curved qd oled monitor so not it's, it's bigger it has oled and it has an enhanced version of oled which enables i think the big thing there is um a more brighter screen one of the limitations of oled is that they don't tend to get bright qd oled fixes that that goes for 1300 so that's 300 dollars more or 400 dollars more i can't do math um I don't think that difference is quite as big of the, as the technology gap between these two monitors. And if they made a 27 inch, it would be, they don't, but I assume it would be less expensive. I don't know about 27 inch OLED monitor, OLED gaming monitors out there. Um, I know Razer's, so I reviewed Razer's Raptor back in the day, the 27 inch monitor. It's a really great monitor, beautiful design. That one costs 700 bucks. Um, it's QHD, so not 4K. So maybe the pricing isn't too elevated, but if you're not in any hurry, I would assume we'll start seeing more mini LED, more OLED gaming monitors. And the big thing that's been holding those back is getting high refresh rates, but that exists now. OLED at 120 Hertz, 144 Hertz, uh, is becoming a, that Alienware is 175 Hertz. So now that limitation doesn't exist. We're going to see more and more of that in lower prices. So yeah, the IPS is definitely at that price is uh, questionable. I agree. Um, even the the MSI Optics that I was comparing this to at home has a, a Q. I believe I bought that for around $500, $600. And it has a QLED model that I think is like $200, $300 more, which is in this thing's price range and you know obviously not as good as oh well, not QLED mini LED I apologize um mm. obviously not as good as um as OLED but uh much more saturated colors in this maybe some people don't like that um but it at least isn't like the bog standard which this kind of feels like your bog standard PC gaming monitor to me it's cool that this uh comes with that um that or that Sony is able to do that now um, and it's cool to see, you know, they hooked this up to a PS5 during the demonstration, uh, which I don't really think a ton of people use monitors with uh, consoles a ton. But it's cool to see Sony, I think with these peripherals, is acknowledging that they're willing for PlayStation, even if this isn't called PlayStation, to become a more PC-like experience. You know, they're moving their yeah. games to PC now. They have their Game Pass style thing, uh, which is limited to the consoles right now. But with these peripherals, I feel like I wouldn't be surprised to see more PC integration from Sony in the future. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I do like that it has 144 hertz refresh rate. In my own experience, it's been a compromise of finding like the right resolution to refresh rate. The, the latest TVs, uh, OLED TVs, have 120 
uh, hertz refresh rates, which is great for gaming. Um, make sure there's an HDMI 2.1 port, um, but they do have that. So now with this monitor, you aren't compromising on the refresh rate for the higher resolution. So if you are a desktop gamer, you want a similar experience to somebody console gaming on their TV, you get the high 4K resolution and you get enough of, you know, you can play it at high enough um, frame rate uh, to match that 144 hertz. So that's pretty nice. Uh, it, now, if you're a esports gamer, or competitive gamer, you you probably want to stick with the 1080, the lower resolutions for the the 240 hertz or 360 or however high up uh, it's getting. Um, like the the M3, the Inzone M3 uh, with its 240 hertz. That one I think is actually kind of more appealing in a way because it's the same uh, screen tech. It's also IPS. It's the same build. Uh, it's like five hundred ninety nine dollars. Um, five twenty nine. I have here in my notes. Five twenty nine. Thank you. Um, and it's you know it's ten eighty p, but it has a much higher uh, refresh rate. So you're not just you know going one for one lower quality than this. Uh, you're current kind of balancing it in and out. Um, and with a, a 27 inch, you can definitely get the benefit from 1440p. I have, I think, a I have a 32 inch 1440p at home, which is a little bigger, but I definitely notice a difference over 1080p. But with a smaller screen, uh, 4K still does make a difference, but maybe not so much of a difference over 1080p. But I'm glad you referenced. Um, brought up the refresh rate, Phil, because there is one gripe I have with this monitor. Oh. I checked with Sony. Uh, let me exit the solo layout. I checked with Sony. Uh, the review unit I was sent did not have an HDMI cable with it, um, which Come is on. wild for any monitor. I was like, maybe that was just my review unit. Uh, but I checked them and they said, because everyone's needs are different, we won't be including an HDMI cable with this monitor, which a, what are other what's the other need? You can't go wireless. I think they're trying to say like if you're you know doing it as for a, a living room console as opposed to a PC, but mm -hmm. you would still need an HDMI cable for that. And yeah. aside from just being an annoyance, that could be a big problem for this because 4K at 144 hertz means you're going to want an HDMI 2.1 cable which is yep. more annoying to get. And it's really nice when that comes with your monitor. This can also take a display port cable, but that doesn't come with this either. Okay, you can't use it out of the box. Yeah. So that's a, that's another taking big the, issue with this. Taking the Apple route. No more, <laughs> no more chargers, no more adapters. So speaking uh, of Apple and Sony, we've been talking about them for quite a bit. We're reaching uh, time on the podcast a little bit, but we do want to get our Let's Fan segment in that we always do. So we'll take a quick break, and when we get back, we're going to cool off with some Taika Waititi. And we're back, and I can't do a New Zealand accent, Phil, but uh, I don't know about you. Lately, I have been needing some like good chill sitcom stuff. I got Apple oh, yeah. TV recently and I tried watching Mythic Quest. Wasn't a huge fan of it, but it's like your traditional workplace style comedy. And it made me think, gosh, I actually miss that kind of show. So I decided to take an old boss, uh, shout out to Abram Pilch at Tom's Hardware. I decided to take his advice and watch What We Do in the Shadows which is a uh, Taika Waititi and Jermaine Clement's uh, vampire sitcom uh, mm -hmm. based on their movie that they made a while back. And it's really good. It's extremely funny. It's very relatable. It has that sort of almost halfway to mumblecore style dialogue that Taika Waititi does. And it's extremely um, relatable. And I think that's a huge strength to his work. And I was talking with you about it. And you mentioned that you are also a huge fan of um, of Our Flag Means Death and, and Wellington Paranormal. And, of course, his movies, Hunt for the Wilder People, and everyone loves Thor Ragnarok, which they should. It's a really good movie. Uh, and we decided that uh, for this week's Let's Fan segment of Gadgets, we just talk about how this man is able to put <laughs> out so much content and not have it feel diluted at all. Yeah, they, they all feel like personal works. Uh, it's it's really impressive. And and he goes from, um, and I, I might be mistaken here, but I, I believe I saw an interview with him and he talks about jumping from one, like he uh, he does one blockbuster movie and then he gives back to the community with an indie. But he's able to mm -hmm. jump between those 
uh, very seamlessly. So going from a budget that's in the hundred millions to in the few millions, and yet he's able to work within those confines and create something that feels very personal. So going from Hunt for the Wilder People is a great example to Thor Ragnarok. And then making Jojo Rabbit after such a big, huge blockbuster Avengers movie. And now he's going back to Thor. So he's he's just very, his entire, uh, I recommend just about his entire library of work. If you're already a big fan of his and you haven't seen his TED Talk, which happened very early on in his career, it sh you should be able to find it on YouTube. Definitely worth watching that. Uh, it, it gives you some insight into his uh, thought process and creative process. I haven't um, seen it. What's the, what's the big takeaway there? The, the big, he just describes how he, he fosters his imagination and he, he lets, he, he doesn't, he embraces the weird in the wild mm -hmm. and he just lets his creativity go and he takes lots of notes and he jots, he uh, sketches a lot of photos and, um, he's kept all of these things from when he was a kid up until now, and he draws from them. And it's really the the bottom. I mean, the what kind of connects everything together is just to be yourself and don't be afraid to be different and to let that creativity just blossom. That's so it's really a, it's a great talk. Yeah. That's such a good message. Um, and especially like something I really see in what we do in the shadows in particular, because it's a show about these weird sort of mon goth Dracula style <laughs> vampires in yep. the modern era. There's an episode where they like go to a nightclub and meet the like, you know, blade style CEO corporate vampires. And they're just completely caught unawares. They're like, why is nobody wearing a cape? I thought we were supposed to wear a cape. It's just like extremely funny and and sweet and they're like still murdering people which uh, but in in a way that you're like okay i can see what the the show is trying to to stay here to say here while still keeping that sort of you know dark comedy roots um just yeah. really cool and uh, i think probably the the biggest thing i like about thor ragnarok actually um i've i'll be honest i've kind of fallen off the mcu a little bit i haven't Same. seen doctor strange yet um, I did not like Thor 2. I actually think Thor 1's a little underrated, but I generally like Kenneth Branagh's work. But Thor Ragnarok is one of my favorite MCU movies, if not my favorite MCU movie. And part of that is like the choice at the end he has to make where like, obviously it's big budget. It's Disney. They can't go as hard with this message as they want to be. But he's like, Asgard is a people not a well, spoiler spoilers for thor ragnarok asgard <laughs> is a people not a place let's smash the monarchy and the hierarchy which created this whole system of colonialism and let's literally let the devil destroy the world and it's this big triumphant moment yep yeah oh it's wonderful i i so i've fallen off the, the marvel movies i haven't seen uh the newest um dr strange i didn't like the first one to be honest there are a lot of movies in there i didn't quite like not the avengers I, of it either yeah, I haven't even seen the, the last few Avengers movies, but I absolutely will be in theaters watching Love and Thunder, which uh, comes out later this year, I believe, um, for Taika Waititi's direction in it. What I love about his work is that he's able to take very serious subjects or topics that have historically been portrayed as being very serious and to just satirize them. And yeah, that's right. Jojo Rabbit, especially. Jojo Rabbit is Nazism. Uh, there's an unbelievable, there's an incredible scene. Um, it's not much of a spoiler, but these um, like these leaders in the Nazi party, they walk into the door and they all spend like a good five minutes just uh, hiling. And, but it's so, but it, it takes so long for them to do it. And it's just this hilarious satire of this like silly, he's what he sees is like this silly thing. But in, of course it was like a very serious thing, mm -hmm. um, but he's able to, to make it like a joke and just show viewers like, look how stupid this was. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we do in the shadows is the same with like, you know, the vampires being a very serious thing, usually dark and scary. And he, they're basically just a bunch of like bros living in this yeah. flat. And, <laughs> you know, he's, he takes these um, and he's kind of the first to tackle some of the topics that he's satirizing. Not in the case of Jojo rabbit. Uh, there have been, 
uh, Nazi satires before, but uh, right. I think that movie is is really really well done and worth watching. I um I agree, uh, and I'm excited to see what he does with a uh, Star Wars because now he's on an unnamed oh, that's Star right. Wars film. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious to see how his style mix mixes with Star Wars because I think he has very naturalistic dialogue. I think that's one of the strengths he has, and as much as I love most Star Wars, uh, I've never found the the acting or the dialogue to be the, the biggest strengths of those movies. So I'm curious to see what he <laughs> can agree. bring to it. And, you know, it's hard to revitalize something as like already well established as that, especially if you differ from it. Um, but he did it with Thor. And now he Thor did. has gone from a character I don't really care about a ton to maybe being one of the most likable, you know, guys in the MCU. Yeah. And, and they really play off of that in the Avengers movies. Um, mm -hmm. They almost, he almost uh, created a new personality for Thor. And, but I do think that star Wars has always had this like underlying quirkiness to it. Mm -hmm. And I think he can play off of that and sort of amplify that. People and I'm excited forget to that see. scene in the original one where uh, Han Solo's like on the comms with a storm with a stormtrooper's captain or something, and he's impersonating a stormtrooper, and they're like, "What's going on?" He's like, "Everything's fine." Hi, how are you? Which is a very like Marvel dialogue moment, right? Where, like, yeah, yeah. The first Star Wars movie. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. I do want to give a shout out to so um, Taiko Itidi did direct some Flight of the Concords episodes. That was one mm -hmm. of his earliest things. Um, and shout out to uh, to Rise Darby, an actor he works with uh, very frequently, and uh, he's uh, the lead in Our Flag Means Death. He's mm -hmm. hilarious as well. Uh, Jermaine Clement, who he worked with in Flight of the Concords, they team up. Um, I believe he's actually co-director of. He's definitely what we do in the shadows. Yeah. Or at least co-showrunner. I don't know how yeah. many episodes they individually direct because they're very busy. Uh, I've been paying attention to the credits for uh, Our Flag Means Death too. Uh, mm -hmm. Taika Waititi is just listed as an executive producer there. But then he okay. also plays Blackbeard. Uh, right. <laughs> he's a major character. Spoilers. He's a major character in the show. Taika Waititi also makes several cameos in What We Do in the Shadows. So he's clearly like trying to make sure people know that this is like something let's that he actually forget. cares about not something he's just stapling his name to right and let's not forget the uh the robot um he plays in in thor mm -hmm. um and i'm uh forgetting the name do you remember does the he name play of does he play korg the, who's like korg, the... there it is yeah the funny okay. silly one yeah yeah um very talented very creative um, director and and surrounds himself with with other very talented people yeah 100 percent. and i'm excited to see where he goes but he's been his work has been my latest uh pandemic obsession and if you've only seen uh thor in the big budget stuff like that that's really cool and and great but you should also check out some of his other work like uh hunt for the wilder hunt people for the wilder or whatever see where yeah. he he got his start and see what he's able to do when he you know doesn't have to hit the laundry list of, of <laughs> typical, you know, uh, cinematic universe stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And it's very, all of his stuff is very lighthearted, easygoing viewing. Okay. So speaking of cinematic universes, it's time to wrap up the show, roll credits, maybe see if Thanos shows up afterwards. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me, Phil. Uh, excellent writer, honorary do -jet. not your first <laughs> appearance on the podcast, but where can people find you? You can find me on Twitter at Philip underscore Tracy. And thanks again for having me. Awesome. Thank you for joining us again. I appreciate your insight, especially on topics like the M2. Uh, I am your host, as always, Michelle Earhart. You can find me on Twitter at at Shell Earhart. We'll go ahead and put our usernames on the screen. And though she's not here with us today, uh, Florence Ion is our usual co-host for Gadgets. You can find her on Twitter at oh that flow uh our background art thank you to vicky lita for uh making that excellent background art for us and thank you to artem golov for his production and editing work making us sound great uh you can email us with any comments and questions at gadgets at gizmodo.com we also have a gadgets landing page on the website if you want to see more of our past work 
Without further ado, though, we will leave you for this week. We air every week, so we'll see you again next week. But for now, we'll leave you to see if Thanos shows up. Bye, everyone. Bye.